Hey, Internet. Hey, Internet. So I'm here. It's uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning, a little after, almost 11 o'clock, getting ready to go on the March for Life in Washington, D.C., World View Everlasting, representing, you know, keeping it real. And you can see behind me uh, just some of the beginning gatherings for the Lutherans for Life part of this event. We're all wearing these green hats. And, you know, I've never been involved in something like this politically, but it is it's really neat to be here and, and be reminded. Really, I'm, I'm going through a little bit of a repentant state here. You know, it's like I assume that Lutherans know that this issue is such a big issue that one-third of my generation has been aborted and that this isn't stopping anytime soon but uh, the more that I'm thinking about it and that I'm listening to people talk it's amazing how little we do mention this that the murder the mass murder that's going on in our country so anyway I'm gonna take some video today and little bits and pieces hopefully you can see the experience through the new and expanded we TV so hey you like this join the Lutheran Ninja clan five bucks a month help this kind of on the street reporting continue with your Lutheran mind in the world today and all the men are created. It's amazing how 500,000 or so alive human beings, all adults, can drive home the reality of the death of infants in our world that weren't even present. I mean, there's a few of those kind of gruesome signs over there, but that wasn't what hit me today. Uh, what hit me today is is how many people still do care about this issue and still do believe that the genocide that's taking place in, uh, in our country is something that is, is just abhorrently evil. But I'm firmly convinced the devil likes us to kill children. Uh, this is shown throughout history that cultures have had this tendency to habit of finding ways to justify the killing of their own infants, and ours is no different. But that doesn't mean that we Christians shouldn't speak up. I, I by no means do believe that abortion is the main issue in America today. I believe the main issue in America today for the church, for Christians, is law and gospel, the truth of the pure doctrine, the truth of the creed. But that being said, how can we possibly speak law and gospel when we refuse to speak up about those who have cast aside the law, you shall not murder, and when those who are being murdered are the very infant sinners who are most desired by Jesus? Let the little children come to me be brought to the waters of holy baptism and united to life in his name. You know what I'm saying? So, anyway, this has been your Wii TV on the street reporting. Whoa! Lutheran television coverage of uh, the March for Life in Washington, D.C. Thanks for checking in. We will catch you next time. Welcome to World We Everlasting, my favorite YouTube addiction. Oh yeah, so um, hopefully you had some fun joining us for the WeTV broadcast last night, checking up on how the status of Broken is doing with its release, not to mention answering your questions live, which is always fun. But that's also why we're here today for the shorter, quicker, faster, a little more insane version of just that with... <coughs> 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 Email. But before we get to a new question, I wanted to give an addendum to a question that was asked last night about angels. And I think this was connected to the Genesis chapter 6, chapter 5 section, but it mentioned the question about the book of Enoch being quoted by the New Testament in the book of Jude and how reliable is this book of Enoch and how much should we trust it? Which might also bring up the question, how reliable is the book of Jude? <laughs> Did he just question if scripture is scripture? <laughs> No, not really, not exactly, but it does bring up the point I wanted to talk about today. So, kind of a little known fact, it's fallen out of the purview of most American Christians, as well as many American Lutherans, is that the church, going way back to the very beginning, has always understood what we call the concept of scripture interpreting scripture, to mean that, now careful how I say this, not all scripture is created equal. <laughs> 
Not that there is any scripture that we would not call inspired and inerrant, but that in understanding what the canon is, where the canon comes from, the question of what actually is the scriptures, and then when we've canonized and or recognized what the ancient church has canonized, how then do we enter that scriptures to trust it? Because for scripture to interpret scripture, you have to start somewhere, right? And so there is this canon within a canon, as it were, of a hierarchy within those scriptures so that you start in certain places and you move forward from them. And historically speaking with the Old Testament, this was bar none, no question, you start with Moses. You start with Moses and then you kind of have David. David's fairly important and then you kind of spread out from there. So you have the Torah and then you have the writings and then you have the prophets. But you don't use the prophets to understand Torah. You use Torah to understand the prophets, yeah? The same kind of thing happens then in the New Testament where the Gospels, the four Gospels have a primacy among them. The actual words, life of Jesus, has a primacy, which had a close running second in the corpus, the body of Paul's works, so that you start with those Gospels and Paul then begins to help you understand what might be missing or left confusing from the Gospels, and then the rest of the letters of the New Testament, including the book of Acts, are interpreted from there. That's why things like Paul's statements about justification in Romans and, say, Galatians do have sort of a primacy over even James' statements in chapter 2 of James about justification, although if you understand it rightly, you can understand he's not even talking about the same thing. He's talking about justification before men. Paul's talking about justification before God and so forth, but there's this movement so that scripture does interpret scripture in a line. In, with, under, around this entire thing is the question of how the New Testament came to be the New Testament, with these various books, these letters, these writings showing up in the early church and no official list, you know, just kind of published by Jesus himself or his apostles, until a guy named Marcion comes along and publishes an official list, which manages to cut out the entire Old Testament and most of the New Testament, and he says this is the only true Bible that there is. After this, faithful church fathers that aren't heretics like Marcion begin publishing their own lists, and then those lists start getting compared to each other, and it all sort of resolves itself around the time of the Council of Nicaea, where everyone's kind of like, yeah, those books we're sure about, those books we're probably sure about, and those books we're not so sure we're sure about, but they're okay, and those books, uh, you know, you don't want those books, right? So you have these different lists that kind of finally resolve into different titles. And most important for you, modern 21st century Christian, is to recognize three of those sections. The first being the so-called Hama Legumina, those books that were Hamo-like, similarly, with one voice, Logos, spoken of. Those books that when the bishops and the letters are being written at this time, nobody questions their authenticity as being from the hands of the apostles and therefore most inspired and inerrant holy writ, holy scripture. This includes, go figure, the four Gospels and the Pauline Corpus, as well as just a couple of others, 1 Peter, 1 John, I think Acts might be in there as well. Anyway, then you have the so-called antilegomena. The same kind of idea of Greek word, only instead of similarly spoken for, they were anti-spoken for, anti-worded, spoken against. There was some debate. There was some argument. There were areas of the church that said, we're not so sure that's scripture. And yet at the end of the day, these antilegomena were received as scripture. They are canonized. They are books of the New Testament, James, Hebrews, Jude, 2nd and 3rd John, 2nd Peter, and Revelation. And then you have a third category of books that everyone kind of knew about, but people weren't so sure were from the hands of the apostles. They end up not making it in. The Didache, the Shepherd of Hermas, some of the other apostolic fathers' writings, and so forth. All this is to say, then, even with and as this, there is a potential for... Hmm, how do you say it without sounding like a heretic? There is a little wiggle room when it comes to unclear passages of the antilegomena that we can just kind of say, well, the early church saw fit to include these. They call these scripture. We receive them as scripture. But maybe if there's a line here or two that doesn't make any sense, we can just be like, oh, well, I'm going to go back to the homilegomena and just trust it there. That would be then how I personally approach Jude's statements about the clearly apocryphal Old Testament pseudepigrapha that means false writing, not actually by Enoch, Book of Enoch, from the intertestamental period, which seemed to be very popular even among early Christians coming out of the Hebrew tradition, but which we should not consider inspired and inerrant. Why does Jude quote this? I don't know. Um, I don't know that Jude himself uh, quite understood what he was doing. In fact, if you look at Jude and 2 Peter, it's pretty clear to most people that if you put them next to each other, one appears to be a copy of the other, and I'm kind of the opinion that Jude's the copy of Peter's book. There's scholars who think it's the other way around 
around. I think those scholars are wrong, but anyhow. So Jude is uh, mimicking Peter's book and throwing in this other piece of sort of what you'd call common tertiary authority that we can accept as valuable for what it says. I mean, here's the quote from Enoch. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That is, there's no reason we can't even, we can't, there's no reason we can't call that inspired and inerrant. Question then, did Enoch himself actually prophesy this? And that's where you get a little bit of a challenge because, well, unless there's some mystical oral tradition that we can't find uh, that somehow gets written down in the intertestamental period of Enoch's ancient words, uh, scholarship would show pretty clearly Enoch did not say these things, which then can lead you to one of two questions. Is Jude got an error in it and therefore all scripture is inerrant? Or is Jude antilegomena and therefore if it isn't inspired and inerrant scripture, so what? It still supports the homilegumena and everything that they say about who Jesus is and what he's done, which is without question inspired and inerrant, yeah? But this, I, this gets awkward, I know. It's the same reason why you don't take the book of Revelation and read the entire Bible through the book of Revelation is because it's a book that was spoken against by some early Christians who didn't even accept it as Christian and as scripture. And what are we going to do? We're going to condemn them to hell because of that? No, we're going to recognize, okay, fine. We think it's scripture, but let's not start there. Let's start with Matthew. Let's start with Paul. And then we can read Revelation through Paul. And lo and behold, what you find is a revelation of Jesus Christ proclaiming him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No big problem, right? Jude can be treated the same way, especially as you treat it in relationship to 2 Peter. Um, yeah. And just in case you like, you're out there in Bronze Age LCMS world and you're like, oh, heretic. Okay, but recognize this distinction was held to by Luther, Chemnitz. Oh, I can't speak for Gerhard per se, but all the Lutheran fathers in general love this distinction. Why? Well, it helped them deal with James. <laughs> uh, as well as uh, it, it helps us understand what sola scriptura really means. Anyway, so if you've heard me today saying that the Bible is not inspired or inerrant, please don't hear me saying that. What I am saying, however, is that within that reality, there is this homilegumina, antilegumina, classical understanding way of reading scripture in order of its clarity, which easily lets us say to a quote from the book of Enoch in the one of the most end piece antilegominas that just barely got tacked on at the end. Yeah, well, maybe it's wrong, but it doesn't actually affect anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, am I on record as saying this? Oh my goodness. An excellent book to read up on this would be F.F. Bruce's The Canon of Scripture. A uh, nice history of both Old and New Testament and how we got them to be what they are. The crazy thing about this is, is as much as it sounds like it's undermining Scripture to the, well, the, the biblicist ear, the 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 Bible fell out of heaven and I just believe it here. It actually strengthens our stand on scripture because we can say without question, the homilegumina, no one in Christian history says it's not scripture, period. It's it's inspired and errant. It's from the mouths of the apostles, period, yeah? Uh, and if you live on the ignorance of trying to have the book fell out of the sky version, but what happens then when you get to that place in Enoch and then you go look up Enoch and you're like, wow, this guy's quoting Enoch. That's just some wild stuff right there. You know, how do you defend yourself? So I will maintain that the homilegumina and antilegumina distinction is one of the most profound profoundly faith-building, inspired, and inerrancy-uplifting teachings about where scripture came from, how we got it, why it's trustworthy, and how that ultimately is all about who Jesus is and what he did, namely sending certain people to give us words which he taught them. Of whom, things like the book of Hebrews, we don't know that those words came from anybody. We don't know. But is it trustworthy? Yeah. yeah. Jude, is he trustworthy? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. The exception, that one line. <laughs> The beautiful thing about Lutheranism is that it has left antilegomena up to Christian freedom, but it does not leave any room to wiggle upon the homilegomena, and it has good historical basis for doing so, tracking it through the hands of the apostles themselves to the mouth of Jesus himself, which is ultimately pretty stinking awesome. Yeah. So how do you deal with your Enoch thing? Well, that's how I deal with it. And if you're going to bring me up on charges on this, go read some Chemnitz first. Yeah. In fact, I'm not going to pull it off the shelf, but Chemnitz is low-key theologic-key. I'm pretty sure deals with this in the opening segments. I think that's right. I'm going to pull it off. Addendum and aside, also before you get too up in arms, keep in mind that the Lutheran fathers also treated the Old Testament Apocrypha in the same way that I've just suggested treating the New Testament Antilegomena, and that they understood both of these to be that way. So they have no question quoting things like Judith, right? When it supports what the Old Testament Torah clearly says. Anyhow, it's, it's a complicated thing. How did the Apocrypha disappear from our English Bibles anyway? It's a fascinating question. It certainly is in Luther's German Bible. Well, what's going on there, Protestantism? Deep question. Not going to answer it for you today, though. There it is, Peeper Volume 1. Yeehaw. For the scriptures of the New Testament, we have the historical witness of the early church. Its witness is unanimous as to the four Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles, the 13 Epistles of Paul, the first Epistle of John, and the first Epistle of Peter, the Homilegumina. But as to the canonicity of the 
epistle to the Hebrews, the second epistle to Peter, the second and third epistles of John, the epistle of James, the epistle of Jude, and the apocalypse, doubts more or less strongly expressed were entertained antilegomena. The historical fact that the early church differentiated between the homilegomena and the antilegomena cannot be changed by a resolution of the later church. Luther too abides by this judgment of the primitive church, he says, appealing to Eusebius, that in ancient times the epistle to the Hebrews, the epistle to, of James and Jude, and the apocalypse had a different reputation. He finds much excellent instruction in the antilegomena, grants that the offensive passages may be explained acceptably by glosses, and will keep no one from appraising them as he sees fit. But he will not class them with the right certain chief books of the New Testament, end quote. As for himself, he will let the doubt entertained by the early church remain. Chemnitz denounced the action of the Roman Catholic Church in declaring the Apocrypha of the Old Testament and the Antilegomena of the New Testament as part of the canon of Scripture by a mere decree and in anathematizing all those who refuse to accept the canon fixed in the Vulgate as anti-Christian. Also, the fathers of the Missouri Synod recognized the distinction between the homilegumina and the Antilegomena. They did, however, leave it to the individual to form his own views regarding any, any, any of the Antilegomena. And that's just the thing. If you actually took away the entire books of the Antilegomena, what you have in the homilegumina would still teach you everything that you could possibly know doctrinally. All they serve to do is support and buttress and say what we already know from the previous books. Yeah? And in that sense, so there you go. Enoch, don't worry about it. Yeah? Yeah. Whew! I was getting nervous like maybe I'd made something up there. I love standing on the shoulders of giants. It is awesome. And now, hopefully, with the very little amount of time we have left... Dear Rev Fisk, I keep stumbling over the Lutheran conditional justification. Unconditional justification is pretty much what we teach, not conditional. Oh! Oh! You're misunderstanding. Here we go. Wherein one may lose their standing with God by ceasing to believe. Yes, that is not conditional justification. It is justification through faith alone. Hmm? And it is unconditionally so that the promise, you are justified, is permanently achieved in Jesus Christ. But if you refuse to believe it, if you stop believing it, which you do have the power to do, you don't have the power to believe it, but you do have the power to stop believing it, well then, the condition's not been something about the justification. You've rejected the justification itself. Huh? And... Mm -hmm. Paradox here at work, but it is pretty potent stuff, and you can't blame the justification for it. The only one at the end of the day you can blame is you. The justification itself remains unconditional. I wash you in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in order to create faith in you. That's the whole purpose of it. And so it's through faith. It's about being through faith, as opposed to being through some mysterious sovereign divine action behind time and space, regardless as if you have faith or not, which tends to be how, well, how the Calvinism works out mathematically. Yeah, now I know I've just mentioned what Calvinism teaches, and there is bound to be a Calvinist is going to say, Calvinists don't teach that. Okay, we've had this conversation before. And even the whole thing about, well, how do you know where Calvinists teach? It was funny. Last time I said, you can't know where Calvinists teach because they have these different confessions they point to and they don't all agree that those are the ones you point to. Someone's like, <laughs> left a comment like, oh, here's the ones we really point to. But that's just it. See, you think that. But there's other Calvinists who insist that they're the only Calvinists who say that what you're saying is wrong. And so at some point, I just have to say, you know, when I work out Calvinism in its mathematics, this is where it comes to. And where it comes to is that justification is not through faith alone. Justification is through sovereign election from eternity alone, even without the potential of faith. So that you have to start saying to someone that if they don't have faith, even though they seem to used to have faith, that they never really had faith in the first place. Which is just kind of, well, certainly offends the one who's fallen away, I'll tell you that. How does this not drive people into fear to trust in the sacraments as a continuing righteousness before God? Well, uh, maybe it does. But see, the sacraments are Jesus, and he is our continuing righteousness before God, no matter what way you spin it. The fact that you actually have that physically outside of your own personal doubt is fantastic. That's kind of the whole point. Like, I can't doubt that the bread goes into me. I can't doubt that the water washed me. And in that case, driven by my own fear, which is justly deserved that I might cast myself into the flames of hell, I am driven back to that place where justification is imputed to me by more promises. Yeah? I washed you. Take eat. This is me and I'm forgiving you right now. So you're, you're maybe seeing that as some sort of work I'm doing to earn that righteousness by taking it by the chewing up of the bread or something. Well, that's not it at all. But the unconditional justification which Jesus Christ achieved is being preached to me not only by words but also by the elements he's attached those words to. And yeah, I'm driven to them. You better believe it. It's the very center of my spirituality. It is where I go to find God. God goes into me as bread and wine and without that, I'm damned. Which is why a Calvinist who's a true Calvinist should actually hate Lutherans. You should think we are the worst possible idolaters that are only putting our faith into bread. See, we don't think it's just bread. Yeah, but you should think that, right? Because Jesus isn't really physically there. He's up in heaven chained to a chair or something. Once and for all, I implore you, set me free by all fears and by all loves, by the sky of overland, by the Aslan himself. And so I'm just trusting bread and therefore I'm not really a Christian.
Yeah. So this is where uh, Calvinists and Lutheran, Lutherans, even though we can talk the justification talk and really agree about it when we're going through, like, say, Paul and Romans for a while, uh, we really have very different views on where this justification through faith alone, by grace alone, actually happens. And that's pretty intense, that distinction. It's so distinct that we actually think we shouldn't commune together because you don't believe that's what's happening, which is justification, is happening. Crazy stuff, huh? I can see how Romanism broke out in the world if people felt unsure of their standing with God. Well, see, that happens no matter what system you're in. People, by their own self-doubt and guilt, begin to feel unsure. What Romanism did was pointed them back to themselves. It actually turned that gift of the Mass, that gift of the Lord's Supper, into a work you were doing, which was connected to the work of the priest, re-sacrificing of Jesus, earning new merit then. You can't blame that on the unconditional justification that only comes through faith. You can blame that on man being sinful and managing to use the best thing of God in the worst possible way, which we've done from the very beginning. And it's not just unique to Lutheranism, not even part of Lutheranism officially. It's just unique to the way we approach and attach our misguided misdirections to whatever God says. He says this, we're like, oh, I think I can use that for my own benefit. And then we go, you know, <laughs> we don't actually make use of uh, what he has given it for. Am I believing enough? I can see how Romanism broke out in the world if people felt unsure of their standing with God. Quote, am I believing enough? See, and that's just it. That is a Calvinist question. That is not a question a Lutheran would even ask. Be surprised how many non-Lutherans try to sneak in. I don't have to worry about believing enough. I have to worry about are the promises in front of me being given to me. <sighs> Amen. Uh, how much belief versus unbelief that I carry in me? Because certainly I do have unbelief I'm carrying in me too, the same moment that I'm believing in the promises. I don't need to figure that out. That's navel gazing, right? That's the whole thing we're being saved from is having to look inward for my own works I'm going to give to God. And so the question, am I believing enough, has managed to take the thing through which Jesus justifies you by pure promise and turn it into a work you have to do, right? This is the whole thing that the sacraments totally remove from you. You don't have to believe enough. Shut up and stop arguing. It's true. And what you find happening when that kind of promises preached as you actually believe. But the moment you start looking at the belief, you start to doubt. Yeah? So uh, faith doesn't look at itself. Faith is not its own object. Faith needs an object to cling to. That's what word and then sacrament, meaning word attached to element, is. And it's all Jesus. It's all his righteousness. It's all for you. It's all gospel. And it is all unconditional as it's given. You can choose to not believe it. That's your problem. It doesn't make it conditional. The, the promise is unconditional. Am I attending enough sacrament services? Well, this is fair enough. Um, the point is, are you in the presence of the word of God? I mean, you should ask that question as an authentic Christian because uh, the other option is I don't have to go to church. Yeah. And so if, if you're not receiving the sacrament, if you're not receiving the word of God, you should be fearful. You are out alone in the devil's world where he prowls like a roaring lion looking for one to devour with nothing to protect you. Yeah, it's a fair question. That doesn't mean that just because you're going to church, therefore you're saved, right? There's unbelievers and hypocrites in the church too. So repent and believe the gospel. But don't think that am I going to the sacrament enough is a bad question. It's a great question. Am I getting enough Jesus? Good question. Sorry to be crass. I am sure there is a man of straw here. I'm just ignorant. Yeah, the man of straw, I think, is that you're importing Calvinist doubts into Lutheran theology, and Lutheran theology is actually the antidote. You can't ask the question, am I believing enough in Lutheran theology, because it doesn't matter. There's only, do you believe or do you not believe, right? And the answer to both is yes, and the answer to both is, but Jesus saves you. Yeah. And that feeds the belief, which continues to triumph over the unbelief. That unbelief will be put to rest once forever in death. Raised up out of that death is you in your faith, your new Adam, all alone with that old Adam left in the grave, and this is your baptism into Christ. Christ. This is your being united with his heavenly body. Yeah? Oh. Hope that helps a little bit. And yeah, so when you're going to argue against Lutheranism, you got to actually take the Lutheran argument and get into it itself. It is not a conditional justification. Justification of the entire world is unconditionally done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This world has been justified to create faith in God, trust in him again, and that trust wherever it is, believing that promise, there are no conditions. Yeah. To reject the promise is to create your own condition of insistent, hard-hearted rebellion, which you're putting upon yourself. Not because God said you have to believe to be saved, but because God said, I'm saving you, believe it. If you're going to say, no, well, it's on you. Yeah. All right. So, hey, cool. Rock on. Thanks for checking in. Hopefully it all made at least some sense. And, uh, uh, catch you next time. <laughs>